Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing in this Indian summer and never ending heat wave? Everybody doing okay? I hope so. Um, it's tough. I wish we wouldn't have these Indian summers anymore. <sighs> but we do. So in my experience, it's probably going to stay hot. You know, not hundreds, but 90s until the end of the month. It won't start getting cooler until November. That's usually how the Indian summers go. So just hang in there, run the air con, drink lots of lemonade. Also wear your mask for the COVID. So this class is for the second week, okay? So just to let you know all these terms, if you see other books or other classes, public speaking, presentational communication, speech, they're all the same thing, right? And hopefully you'll get the techniques that you need that uh, you can use in other areas of your study and your job and work. They help with giving you more confidence and poise. And uh, to reiterate, because I had a few people, I guess they didn't listen to the whole lecture last week. Um, this class, uh, for two reasons, one, the COVID and we can't be in person. Um, and two, it's an introductory. So this class is for teaching you the techniques for speech presentation, and public speaking. I'm not gonna demand that you do a speech, okay? Again, we're with COVID. I don't have an interaction with you, you know, face-to-face. -face. And uh, I think the techniques are more important at this time because uh, when I took speech classes to high school and college, uh, you can ask an American student a few years later the techniques. Now, they might not be nervous and they can get up and do a speech, but the speech will probably suck because they won't remember the techniques. So take advantage of this in this class that um, I'm giving you the techniques. And if you remember them, like I said, they can help you in uh, other areas of your life. So uh, don't worry. Know the notes. Listen to the lectures do the questions, and you'll just take tests like my other class, a midterm and a final. But, uh, you know, you're not supposed to come over and, okay, I'm going to give a 15-minute speech, and no, that's not going to happen. But don't worry. Be happy, okay? So I guess I shall go to the material. Hopefully I do this correctly. I went wild before, so... Okay, it should be easy to access. There it is. I got to minimize my face again. Sorry. You don't need to be looking at me all the time. Okay. You should be able to now follow from the beginning slide. See? Uh, school code ENG 103. Public speaking is the class title. Week two. Okay, so we're ready to get into this. The right topic is very, it's a very important topic. It's uh, something that will be the success or the uh, unsuccess of your speech. And I'll read a little bit and then we'll uh, talk about it, okay? So the key, is, as I start up here to the left, the key to a successful public speaking experience is the right topic. And there is a very effective formula or technique, because some people will say formula, isn't that what the baby drinks? No, technique for choosing it. Uh, the formula is so effective that if your topic meets all the criteria, uh, your success is absolutely guaranteed. Okay. Oh, I just remembered, I have to tell you something before I get into the, uh, right here, the three criteria. We're gonna do this a little different than what we taught the other courses, because these things are connected. I wanna make sure you get the accurate questions. So, um, Normally I read and then I look at the bottom of the page and then I'll write questions on the whiteboard. 
This is different with this uh, public speaking class. I will read through all the material. I'm gonna repeat this at the end in case people are asleep in the beginning and they don't hear me. What do I do? Um, so I'll read through all the material. Then there's questions here, which I will read and explain exactly what I want. Like when I write the questions on the right board, you know, for like a history class. And then from there, you can write your uh, <coughs> questions and answers on, uh, on your own piece of paper and take a photo and scan it and send it to me in an email. That's how you'll do it. So I will not be writing on the whiteboard like I do when I have a history class or a uh, literature class, okay? So remember that I'll repeat it at the end in case you're playing Candy Crush right now, uh, Pamela, and you're not paying attention, okay? So again, the formula is so effective that if your topic meets all three of its criteria, your success is absolutely guaranteed. Uh, the three criteria are, you must have significant knowledge about the topic you're going to be speaking on. Yes. So basically what I'm trying to say here is you cannot have just the most basic information on the topic because again, if you really give a speech somewhere and someone knows a lot about your topic, usually when people give speeches, the audience asks questions. We can't do that here in the class due to COVID. So I encourage the students to ask questions. So if you're giving a speech for your company, and then a man or a woman knows more about it than you and asks you questions that are a little more knowledgeable than just the most basic information, you will look foolish, right? So significant means a lot, right? So if you're giving, let's say, you're giving a speech about diamonds, and all you know, and all you present in your speech that all oh, diamonds can cut glass and, uh, uh, you know, it's the hardest uh, uh, compound, you know, and then somebody asks you a question, where do most of the diamonds come from in the world? Uh, you know, what's the other compound of a diamond or, you know, basic knowledge of diamonds that you don't know? So that's why in whatever topic you should have significant, which means, you know, a, a lot of knowledge about the topic, right? You just can't have the most basic uh, knowledge. And then two, you must sincerely care about the topic you're going to be talking about. Okay, I'll be honest here. Okay, and hopefully you will understand what I'm trying to say. And again, this mimics uh, life, right? And I'll give you that example too. Really, you don't have to sincerely care about your topic, I feel, but uh, you should probably sound like you too, right? Uh, because let's say you, you have significant knowledge, but you really don't care about the topic. Uh, people can tell, right? People can really tell that you don't care and they're gonna wanna listen to you less or not believe you, right? So again, maybe you followed step one and you acquired uh, significant knowledge, but when you talk, you know, imagine like, uh, you know, okay, I, I try to use examples that everybody can understand, right? And we can all relate to. 
So let's say for the guys that are in my class, I don't have the attendance sheet back yet, but uh, so I'm talking to the men here. Uh, men, you know how it is when you really got this strange feeling that your girlfriend doesn't love you anymore. So you question her about whatever your questions are and she answers you, you know, like, yeah, no, I'm not seeing another guy or yeah, sure, I care about you. Why are you asking me those questions? Why are you forcing me to tell you an answer, right? So she's answering correctly, like having significant knowledge, but she's not sincere. You can feel it, you can tell. She's just telling you what you wanna hear, so you shut up. But you can tell, you know, she's not the same anymore when she really cared. So if you don't really care for your topic, you better sound like a salesman and fool the audience. Otherwise, they're going to catch you. You know, it's like, um, let's say if I, uh, you know, well, personally, I have a uh, seafood allergy to a lot of seafood, especially shellfish. And it makes me sick because my parents made me <laughs> eat that stuff to find out when I was a kid and I would throw up. So if I was giving a speech and tell, talking to you about the deliciousness of octopus and the deliciousness of live squid and all these things, I probably could not tell you with a sincere face that ah, they're so good because I know I want to throw up. So remember these two, first two points are very important. All right, three, you must have a strong desire to impart, means share your knowledge and feelings to your audience, okay? Again, I'll be honest with you. Take my soldier there, right? Ooh, okay. Okay. Um, you don't need to have a strong desire, but again, unless you can act it, and if you do not, people can tell. Right, A person with a strong desire that really believes in something or someone, they will tell you. And you believe them. They'll say, man, I'm talking about my best friend. He's a great guy. You know, he did this for me. I can't believe it. I'm so lucky to have his friendship. Hey, you can tell, that, or, or the audience can tell you have a strong desire to share your information. But, you know, if you say, yeah, I have a best friend. Uh, I think he's a cool guy. And, uh, I'm probably <laughs> pretty lucky to have. That sounds like no desire at all, right? I mean, you're saying the words, right? But uh, where's the desire, right? So you have to, just like in a normal life, you get something like if you won the lotto, I'm sure, you know, and that's from whatever country you're from. But if you won the lotto, then you're going to run and try to share with your mom and father. So not like they're going to call you a son. I think I saw you on the TV last night. Did you win the lotto? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'll talk to you later. I got to do something. I got to do my homework for teacher Barry's class, right? There's no desire there. So those three are important and they will show up as, a, as answers for your questions, okay? Okay, next, Dale Carnegie, that's how you say his name, it's a funny name, the patron saint of public speaking training. Now you're gonna ask me, especially people with no Catholic background, right? A saint is a revered person that uh, the church has declared a saint, almost like a human angel. And then the patron means like the number one, <laughs> most popular, right? Most famous. So Bill Carnegie, the patron saint of public speaking training. 
<coughs> excuse me, what's going on with my soldier? Began using this approach or technique to identify appropriate topics almost a year ago. So you see how that connects into choosing the right topic? If you choose the right topic, then you can use these three techniques very well. Once you choose the wrong topic, you're talking about making a very uninteresting speech with a lot of mistakes, okay? So patron saint of public speaking. So he's like the number one guy. Everybody says public speaking. Everybody thinks of his name. We have people like that for different generations. Uh, in basketball right now, I bet who's the patron saint of basketball? It's probably LeBron James. And a number of years ago, it would have been Kobe Bryant, right? Before him, uh, maybe Shaquille O'Neal, before him, Michael Jordan, right? So hopefully one of you in here will become the patron saint of something, right? And if you do get very famous and wealthy, don't forget me, your teacher. I need a condo in Las Vegas, okay? Thank you. Okay, here we are. The way Mr. Carnegie put it, which means said it, was that you must have earned the right to talk about your topic. You must be excited about your topic, it helps. And you must be eager, that means you have a lot of desire to talk about your topic. No one has since Bella a better approach. So again, if you look for a topic that makes you excited, if you look for a topic that makes you eager to talk about it, you're on the right path to, as the title of this chapter is, choosing the right topic. So on the bottom, You've probably seen this formula at work. It might have been a business presentation where the presenter clearly knew the subject well, was fired up about it. That is a slang term. It does not mean anything about fire. It just means excited. So a different way of saying, I'm excited about having a date with Angelina Jolie. I can say, I'm fired up about my date with Angelina Jolie, especially since she divorced Brad Pitt. Uh, continuing, and let his enthusiasm spill over to the audience. Okay. Oh, where's my arrow? There, right. So, enthusiasm is when you're really, really excited and want to do something. Excited, you could just be sitting there, but enthusiasm, you want to get up and do it. And then spill over to the audience means your enthusiasm, the audience also receives it and then they have enthusiasm. So it's like spilling a glass of milk. Instead, they're saying you spill your enthusiasm on there and then they get excited. It's just like a sporting event. You know, you, you jump up and down because one of the Dodgers hit a home run. And as you jump up and down, the guy next to you is like, huh, yeah, home run, sure, Dodgers, yeah, yeah, right? And then that's when his girlfriend leaves, like, I can't take the sports bar stuff. So here we are. Maybe it was a fire and brimstone sermon that made you sit up and take notice. Uh oh, here we go, this is tough, right? Okay, this comes out of the old, American churches, okay? The way that uh, the pastor kept the people from falling asleep in church or paying attention or making them actually want to follow the Ten Commandments and do what is right that pastor would give what is called a fire. Yes, a real fire here and brimstone sermon. 
basically fire and brimstone refers to hell. So if you just, you know, give a sermon and say, well, you know, be good to your neighbor and, you know, look after yourself and have a smile. Some people yawn, some people go to sleep. But if the same pastor uses a fire and brimstone speech, you know, he might say something like, if you are not kind and loving to your wife and children, you will go to hell and burn in eternal fire. And then the husband's like, I don't want to do that. I better be nice to my wife and kids, right? So that's what a fire and brimstone sermon is, okay? Uh, next, or perhaps it was that town meeting where one of your neighbors who you never thought could make a compelling speech, and compelling means, you know, one that you want to listen to, it's moving your heart, it compels you. Uh, this person made a compelling speech, carried the night by convincing everyone that speed bumps should be <laughs> installed on your street. Okay, so that's how darn compelling this guy was, because most people wouldn't a guy said, I'm going to give a speech that we need speed bumps in the town. And people are like, oh, man, whatever. But if this guy was so excited and compelling that he convinced everyone, he did a good job. Now, imagine what you could do with a great topic or a speech. Okay. So here. Think back to every really effective speech ever heard and you'll discover that all the speakers knew their topics inside out or as we say backwards and forwards inside out means you just know everything about it you will not sound foolish when a guy asks you a few questions and you say i just know the basic stuff you know uh no uh they will or they all felt strongly about what they were talking about. And they all clearly wanted to get their message across. So again, as I, I told you the first week, I noticed a lot of my, it's a very common too. Students have a backwards thinking. If you were in my class and I had to have you get a speech or give a speech, a lot of students would say, even come up to me and ask me, what can you give me the topic? I don't know what to do. And to me, that's a really dangerous idea. Why? Because now if I give you a topic, well, one, you might not like it. Two, you probably don't know a lot about it. So you have to do a lot of studying. And then how do you know if you've studied enough? You're going to have to ask somebody, is my knowledge sufficient. So that's why I always recommend that people do a speech about themselves, their family member, or their job, something they know a lot about. If you do it about yourself, you're the expert. You know, you're a Korean guy and you're telling me that you used to date Kim Tae-hee and you were in a uh, Korean boys uh, band. I don't know. I, I'm not going to go to Seoul and call the police and say Alex Hong was in a boy band or he dated Kim Tae. I have no idea. So that's why I say to you can lie, right? Um, it's just about doing the speech correctly and making it exciting. That's the issue, right? And uh, so, again, don't think about a teacher giving you a topic and then like, oh, my teacher gave me a topic about uh, hot dogs, you know, and then you hate hot dogs. You don't know where the hot dog was invented, the history of the hot dog, and you got to study, right? Not as effective as you giving a story about or a speech about your high school years in uh, Seoul or Manila or Tokyo. You're the expert. You can say what you want. And people probably want to hear because we're not from Japan or Korea, and we want to hear it, right? So again, don't think the backwards reverse style, right? Okay. 
And remember, when you like it, you will want to get your message across, okay? Next. Starting up here on the left-hand side at the top, if you know everything you need to know about your topic, you'll have enough confidence that distractions, interruptions, or losing your train of thought won't bother you. Okay, so let me go over that fully. If you, we'll, we'll flip it. <clears throat> if you don't really know all about your topic, you, I'm just gonna say a little bit, I don't care. I'm gonna try to run through my speech. Okay, the instant you have these strange distractions or interruptions, or losing your train of thought has nothing to do with the train, but how you forget what you're thinking about. If you don't have enough knowledge, you will, <laughs> you will have what American college students call a brain fart, okay? So that means you'll do a fart in your mind and it'll wipe out all your basic knowledge that you have, right? And then your speech or public speaking is going to bomb. It's going to be a, a destruction, okay? But if you know all that you need to know, that gives you such a confidence that when the noisy airplane goes by or the train goes by or a classmate starts yelling and throwing donuts out the window and it interrupts you, you just wait and wait till he runs out of donuts. And then you can start your speech. And you can continue, why? Because you know everything about it. You just didn't put a few messages together and you didn't think about the sequence. And then you're like, was I my speech about frogs? Or was it about spiders? I really don't remember. <laughs> and then, you know, what are you going to do? Well, I, I think I was talking about reptiles, you know. The students are like, first he was talking about spiders, then he went to frogs, and now we're at this guy's lost, right? So, as you see here, if you really care about your topic, you won't worry during your delivery, that's when you perform it, about how you look and sound. That's another issue. Uh, that's why I gave you that sheet last week in the first week you are your worst enemy not actually uh, the people watching your speech and that's especially when you're in a classroom right and some people i think some people said maybe more women than men why always got to clarify here right why because women spend time trying to look pretty and do their hair and men tend to be a little more on the sloppy side, right? And that's why men will get married and then later the wife says, do you realize that your shirt is full of crumbs? Do you realize that your hair is not combed? And the guy, uh, right? The lady's always looking sharp, always looking nice, puts on the right amount of lipstick, combs her hair correctly, makes sure her blouse looks nice. So that being said, a lot of people will worry, do I look okay? Is, is all my hair's in place? instead of just, hey, go up there, deliver your speech. You should be okay, right? But you gotta worry about the right thing. Next, um, again, if you're, uh, you won't worry during your delivery about how you look and sound. Why? You'll be too busy concentrating on the message you want the audience to go away with. And that's basically the bottom line. Whatever the message is to your speech, that's what you want the audience to lead with. If you're giving a speech on how to get rich in real estate, the last thing you want them thinking about and your message is that they have a plan to get rich with real estate because that's what you concentrate on. If you're really looking forward 
to the opportunity to get your message across. You'll do so with feeling and enthusiasm. And your audience will catch your mood. This goes back to the last page and your enthusiasm spilled over. So if you're in a happy mood, you're feeling good, the audience will catch that same mood. In short, you'll succeed, right? Exactly. Again, you know, we can apply this to dating. I don't think ladies, when they're dating someone, um, I don't think they're happy if the guy's depressed all the time, right? Depressed and angry. Ladies are like, hey, that's not what we're going out for. But if you're in a happy mood and you do happy things for you and your lady, she will catch it like, wow, he's happy. and He's taking me to a nice restaurant. We're going to do a nice movie. And then she should be happy too, right? So you can see how these things relate to life. Okay? In short, you'll succeed. And that's the goal. Again, like I said earlier, if you wanted to lie about who you dated some famous woman, like I lied about my date with Angelina Jolie, you're not giving your speech to the police. So no one's going to check if you're true. You just have to follow the techniques to do a nice speech. So a few white lies here and there, like Inky told me one time she was going to get married to Johnny Depp, but then changed her mind and wanted a younger guy, Ryan Gosling, but then he ran away to Eva Mendes. So, you know, I don't know if I believe these stories, but he told me. So here we go. On the other hand, if you try to make a speech on a topic you don't know enough about, you will fail. That's another thing. If you pick a topic that is just out of your reach, but you think, well, I'll sound good, right? Or I think I will sound good, but you don't know enough, man, people will know and they might laugh at you. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I was teaching a theology class, which is the study of religion. And uh, I had a student and he lied to me. Of, of course, at first I had to believe him, right? But uh, I asked him, you know, did he like the Bible? And he said he read the Bible all the time. I don't know if there's any Bible readers in this class. So if you are, you'll, you'll <laughs> follow me and know the answer. So I then asked him, since he said he read the Bible quite frequently. I said, what's your favorite part of the Bible? And then he tells me, uh, yeah, uh, my favorite part of the Bible is where the guy makes coffee. You know, and I sit here and I say, what? I've read the whole Bible. I don't know any spot where a guy makes coffee. You know, there was no Starbucks in Jerusalem. What, what's going on here? So I say, what part of the Bible is this? And he tells me, yeah, it's the part where the guy makes coffee. And then I said, where? And he says, oh, it's, it's called he brews, right? Like brew a cup of coffee. And I had to tell him, no, that's Hebrews, the original language for the, the Israelites, the Jewish people. It has nothing to do with a guy making coffee. You're just Hebrew people. Oh my gosh. So see, he was lying. He didn't know enough about his topic to be believable. People would just laugh him out of church. So anyway, <coughs> let's continue. It's not possible to have a successful speaking experience when you don't know what you're talking about. Amen, brother. Right? So, how do you gain knowledge or enough knowledge, which is most important? Uh, how do you do this about a subject to feel confident 
right? So that's where I have students say, well, I don't want to read a dictionary or, you know, I don't want to do that. Um, that's not what I'm saying, right? Uh, <laughs> that's so funny. Here you go. There are two ways. Remember that. That sounds like a good question that I'm going to talk about later. Okay. There are two ways. Study and experience. If your remarks are based on both of these criteria, you will definitely be speaking on the right topic. Okay. Again, this is why I have studious students and they can study and gain enough knowledge and maybe they like the topic and they can give a decent speech. But <laughs> I also have some students that don't like to study. Yeah. On Peel, Damogen, not Leso. Leso, he's a good guy. He'll study all night long. So that's why I encourage you to do a speech about your class. I mean, about you. Maybe you can do it about the class. I don't know. That's some funny people. You have the experience. No one's more of an expert than you about you or your family or your job. And in those ways, you don't have to study. Alex Hong has to study about himself and being the owner of Saba Saba, I don't think so. Just write the speech, baby. So and as you see here, if your remarks are based on both of these, again, you will definitely be speaking on the right topic. Wow, if you could do both, it'd really be a knockout of the park. But again, about yourself, you don't have to study. Uh, <laughs> people often, have trouble deciding at what point their study and experience have sufficiently or enough qualified them to speak about a subject. I, I My rule of thumb is just when you know it's a lot, it's a lot. You don't have to be like, is it really a lot? Is it not? I mean, you can do it, but anyway. So here we go. Well, one reasonable rule of thumb. Uh, so that has nothing to do with your thumb. It's just a saying that one good, technique, one rule of thumb. Is that if you know more about it, the topic that is, then will most people in your audience, you're qualified to speak on that topic to that particular group. So, if you're pretty sure you know more, then that's a good speech to give because people will say, I didn't know that. Or he's talking about things that I had no idea. So, you know, you can learn many things. For example, I had read about, uh, the Forbidden City in uh, Beijing. And I tell you, you, when you read about a place or something, it's not like actually being there, right? Uh, I would have to say uh, out, of, out of the places that I visited in the world, uh, the Forbidden City was an exception. Why? Because most places you see and you think it's huge. And then when you see it in person, it's not that big, right? It's just not that big or that impressive as the way they have it on the video. But let me tell you, when I went to the Forbidden City, my God, it's, it is a city. It is huge, you know? You're going to walk for a long time. Uh, now, what I want to refer to this public speaking is by going there, even though I had studied uh, about the great, uh, the Forbidden City, I went there and got some firsthand experience about something I didn't know. I remember I saw the Last Emperor movie and uh, all the furniture that the 
last emperor and the empress and handed down from hundreds of years of uh, different kind of rule and kings, or well, they're called emperors. Uh, it, it looked like a lot of it was missing. They didn't have as much. And of course the tour guide said, oh, uh, be careful, uh, Yishuan and Wani. They said a lot of the emperor and empress's furniture was stolen by Chiang Kai-shek and moved to Taiwan. I had no idea about that. I didn't know that. I mean, maybe you girls know about that as being Taiwanese. But I'll tell you, I'll give you an answer that can protect yourself if somebody just gets angry with you and says, hey, you shouldn't have stolen those things. Because I had a man from Taiwan and he gave the perfect answer. And he said, well, when China became communist, they destroyed a lot of the historical items from the country because they didn't think China's past was worth keeping. They wanted modernization. So that being said, the fellow from Taiwan said, so you should thank Chiang Kai-shek and the Taiwanese because we still have it in a museum. We protected it where your grandparents would have burned it. So there you go. Makes a lot of sense. Right? So again, uh, if <laughs> most of your listeners know more about the topic than you do, then there isn't much you can accomplish. Unless, of course, you're bringing a completely new approach or angle. And this is very important right here. Most students read this and don't pay attention. And I will help you with that. What it means here, okay. Now, obviously, with what we read up here, if I had a class and uh, let's say I had uh, out of the first 10 students, I had two students give a speech about McDonald's, right? And their speech was more or less the same. People kind of got confused, which was which they sounded so commonly alike, right? And then the next person comes up, the 11th student and says, I'm gonna do a speech about McDonald's. People are gonna feel like they wanna pull their hair. So, but if your speech gives a completely new approach or angle than the other two guys, then your speech will have success, right? You can do it for the third person on McDonald's, but you're going to talk about completely different aspects of, uh, of the same topic matter of the speech, right? So the first two guys, let's say they just talked about, well, you make a Big Mac like this, and then the French fry is grilled like this, and you use this kind of uh, fat, and then the shake machine is like this. So both of them did those, and you work the cashier like this. So they're expecting you to do the same thing. Instead, you talk about the actual training and how there is a McDonald's university that owners and managers must go to, to learn the techniques. So you're talking about management techniques, traveling out of state to a McDonald's university, the standards you have to have, how much you have to have to start a McDonald's and open your own McDonald's. So these things are completely new, completely fresh new knowledge about McDonald's. So don't forget that, okay? Yeah, yeah. Next, don't worry about the possibility of some people in the audience knowing more about your topic or some aspects of it than you do. <laughs> You're gonna ask yourself, why I'm scared. 
He knows more about it than I do. Oh my gosh, what the game? Uh, why? Because you're going to be speaking on something that everyone in the audience is interested in and have the parentheses here, or presumably they wouldn't be there or <coughs> like, uh, otherwise they wouldn't be there. And it could happen and it does happen that there will be one or two <coughs> people who know as much about the topic as you do. But here's the key right here. Where's my arrow? That doesn't matter. They still will be interested in hearing your thoughts on the topic. They will be curious about your experiences and how those experiences affect your views. So this is tied into this completely different approach. Uh, maybe you don't have a different approach, but I'll use my Forbidden City uh, example. If a Chinese person, let's say a, let's say a Beijinger, somebody from Beijing wrote about their experience at the Great Wall, being that they are Chinese, grew up in Beijing, are influenced by the uh, Chinese history and communism, there's a good chance they will write a completely different report than someone like myself who's from the United States and not from China, not from Beijing, uh, you know, and not influenced by communism. So people will want to listen to it. That's why you might have a group of Chinese and they say, ah, we know everything there is about to Forbidden City, another Chinese guy talking about that, how boring. And then they say, ah, a foolish American guy. You know, what's his name, Barry? Let's hear what he has to say. What was his experience? And I'll say, which is the truth. Uh, even though I went there during the day, I had a very strange feeling as I went through the huge Forbidden City and saw the rooms and what have you. I I felt there were a lot of ghosts there. I don't know why I felt that, but that was my true feeling. I mean, Chinese people might think I'm crazy, but uh, I would, if someone said, hey, I'll sneak you in for free tonight at midnight in the Forbidden City and you can walk everywhere you want alone in the dark. I, I wouldn't do it if you gave me a thousand dollars really would be scared that some old ghosts were gonna come and, oh, I don't know. That's just my feeling. Okay. And this is why you will often see a panel of three or four speakers all dealing with the same topic and that happens in conventions. They've all had different experiences and all have different views on the subject matter because of that, right? That's what I'm saying. Always remember that never in the entire history of the world has there been anyone exactly like you with exactly the same experiences you've had. You're a unique person, all of you, every one of you. And what's more, there never will. That's why we have an old saying. They, after that person died, they threw away the mold that made them, right? Like there probably won't be another Michael Jordan. There probably won't be another Bruce Lee. There won't be another Elvis Presley. People maybe will become close or can look like them, but they don't really have their talent or ability, right? So everybody, is unique here, all my students. So you can have a different uh, perspective on many different things. So as it continues here down at the bottom, every experience you've ever had, top left, and every lesson you've ever learned is a story waiting to be told again. That's why I tell you guys, if you have to do a speech, do it on yourself. Do it on 
your very first kiss as a young man, right? Your first kiss as a high school boy. People will want to listen to that story and it will be unique to you. Just like me when I, if I do my story about how I was 30 when I almost kissed a woman for the first time, right? All right, so here, all you need is the right audience. And that's true too. Once you get the right audience that wants to listen to you, it's like you can probably say anything. You know, what's your speech about? Uh, it's about sand. Oh, really? Uh, what about sand? I like it. Uh, I found it at the beach and I put it in my shoes. And if you've got an audience that likes you for whatever reason, then you've got the right audience, okay? What happens if you have significant knowledge about a topic, but your interests have changed, you know, at the last minute? Uh, when I usually teach this class and I'm assigning a speech or letting them choose, some students just change it every week or they find the first week and then at the last week they change it. I don't know why. But it says here your interests have changed and you are no longer excited about it. it. Sounds like a girlfriend getting tired of a boyfriend very quickly. It's probably a good idea to get someone else to give the talk, but you see that's not always possible. It might be too late. You might have passed the deadline. Uh, perhaps there's no one else available who knows as much as you do about the subject. Because significant knowledge is the most important criteria or judge in the topic selection formula. Then at that point, you have to give the talk. So it would be different if you're going to give a talk about wild mushrooms. And then right before the end, you're like, <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. I want to give a speech about uh, fleas, right? Since my dogs give me a lot of fleas. The teacher might ask, does anybody have knowledge of mushrooms and wild mushrooms? And if somebody says, yeah, they might ask you to switch. Uh, you still might not do the fleas. But if nobody, nobody knows anything, like, I'm sorry, we're all city students. We never were in the country or in the mountain to get the wild rush rooms. At that point, you're probably going to have to still give it, right? Even though your tastes have changed. Okay, just letting you know. Next, start off your presentation by pretending with all your might, that means your power, that what you're talking about is the most important thing in the world to you at this particular time. And again, that's why I told you before, if you're a good actor, if you can fake the enthusiasm, then this technique is easy. You just, hey man, this is the most important thing to me in the world, right? You're gonna have to pretend a little bit, but again, Choose a topic that you really, really like, then you don't have to pretend in this. So, again, if you're like doing a speech about your girlfriend and you just love her more than anything in the world and you think she's the greatest, the greatest woman in the world, when you talk about her, they can see that uh, you have this enthusiasm and you're not pretending, right? So, here it says, if you do this, an amazing effect takes place. That's on the audience though, not you. After a moment or two, ah, but look at this. You'll start to feel the way you're acting. So you're lying to yourself, but kind of hypnotizing yourself. So if you say, yeah, man, I love these mushrooms, and the dirt, and hallelujah, baby, baba. You do that for a while and then you'll start actually feeling it where first you're just acting, you know, lying. And then you're like, you know, I think I, I feel like I really do love mushrooms. Okay. And the author says, try it. Okay. Just try it. It works. 
act happy, and you'll begin to feel happy. Act excited about something, and you'll become excited about it. So, Temujin, you're like, oh, tall, tall, she's great. Yeah, and then you'll start feeling that way, even though you're just acting and asking tall for $20. Um, act as if you care, and you'll start to care, right? So here. You might also run in the situation or run into the situation where although you know all you need to know about a particular topic, right? remember the substantial knowledge and do you have an emotional investment in it, which means you do like it a lot. You don't particularly want to give the time. Uh-oh, this is a different version of what we talked about over here, okay? Perhaps down here, perhaps you have a conflicting engagement, which means you have some other kind of engagement happening at the same time. Or maybe you have to travel a long distance to make the presentation. It could be you're just feeling a little lazy. My students would never feel lazy, would they? Like some students who turn in assignments one through eight on the ninth week. They're not thinking about being lazy. It's in the case of not being too excited about a topic, you probably should decline the invitation. But there also may be compelling reasons why you should make the speech. So kind of similar to the one we, we spoke earlier, uh, it's best to decline it in the beginning though, right? But when it gets too late, as it says here, in these circumstances, you must talk yourself into wanting to give the talk. So if it's just, you know, your feelings changed, uh, but it's getting late, you're going to have to talk yourself into it and say, okay, I am going to have to give my first speech and sound happy about it. Come to terms with whatever good reasons exist for you taking on the task or giving the speech. Again, it could be that you're the best person to do it. Right? You could be the most qualified, right? You could be the one Russian guy that grew up in Pyongyang and your speech was about growing up Russian in North Korea, you know, who else is going to do it but you? Uh, or perhaps you're the only qualified person available at the particular time. It should be easy to convince yourself to give the talk if the person who asked you to give it is important to you, such as your boss or an important client or a good friend. So this really comes in the workplace, not really in the classroom. So you decided, yeah, I don't want to do the speech, but your boss asked you to give it. Or an important client that if you don't give the speech, he might take his money away from your company. Or maybe a good friend that you don't want to disappoint. Imagine you're at a wedding and your best friend says, I want you to give this big speech about me and my wife, who was my girlfriend, and you saw us together. You know, he's doing it because he loves you and he says you're the closest person to him. You're going to tell him later, I don't feel like doing it. I just want to eat the wedding cake and try to catch the garter. You know, you're not too much of a good friend at that point, right? So probably most people don't want to disappoint their friend, okay? Best buddy. Maybe the audience really needs to hear about your particular experiences and views because they most closely parallel the audience interests. Okay, so what that means here is let's say you're giving a speech about your alcoholism and most of the people in the audience are 
alcohol anonymous uh, anonymous members so they're interested in your life story right not some guy that gets up there are you an alcoholic no but i like beer a little bit they don't want to hear that speech right they want the guy that gets up there and says yes i used to drink so much i lost my job and then i wouldn't stop drinking and i lost my girlfriend you know then i slept in a car and then you talk about how you turned your life around, right? So again, your particular experiences and views because they most closely parallel the audience interest. They might want to hear it. You're qualified. The point is, much like acting, which I mentioned earlier, as if you care about your topic, <laughs> will result in your actually beginning to care about it. Finding a way to rationalize why you should give this particular talk at this particular place, at this particular time, to this particular audience will result in your wanting to do it. The third criteria will therefore be met. What I can say about this area, it's kind of funny. It's kind of like a reverse psychology. But, uh, you know, again, we'll read related to dating. Um, let's say, you know, guys, you really like this one lady and your friend told you some of the things she likes or her hobbies, right? Unfortunately, you don't have these hobbies but you want to impress her. You want her to like you. So, you know, you find out she likes to play tennis. So she asks you, what sports do you play? Or what sports do you like? And of course you're gonna say tennis, right? Now, if you see that puts a smile on her face and then she asks you, more about tennis you will probably feel happy and then you know say some other lies and then they will all get easier like it says here you'll start feeling good about it she says oh you like to play tennis oh well, yes i do even though you probably don't know how to hold the racket correctly and then she'll say how many times a week do you play uh three times a week uh, what's the name of the park you go to? Oh, I go to various places. I just, you know, I don't pay attention to the names. I just try to find an te open tennis court and I'm there, you know, and if there's no humans, I'll play with a raccoon. So it just flows, it flows. And the same thing here, when you start pretending and doing stuff and you'll start caring about the topic, okay? Just like you care about the lady. Hopefully she doesn't challenge you and say, let's go play tennis together. See if you can beat me. You, as Drago said in Rocky Three, you will lose. So don't do it, All right? Okay. So repeating, if you meet all three of the formulas criteria, success is guaranteed. The confidence generated by a thorough knowledge of your subject, bolstered or supported by your sincere belief in what you're saying, writing on your desire to impart or share this information and feeling, that's a misquote there, feeling, right, to your audience creates an unbeatable combination that will render a lackluster presentation impossible. <laughs> so uh, lackluster means no energy, no desire, just reading like a robot. So if your speech has to compare with that person, you should easily win, right? Okay, so let me do the nutshell. We did a nutshell last week and you'll see these every week. These uh, highlight the high points of the chapter. It's a slang term in a nutshell. So let's say if you've seen a 
nutshell of a walnut, okay? What they mean by this is here we had to read all the material, all these pages of material. Sometimes a person doesn't have time to do that or doesn't like to study like that. So this person will ask his buddy, I'm not gonna waste my time reading the book. So buddy, will you give me the knowledge in a nutshell? So that's why we do the points that cover the major importance of the reading without you actually having to do all the reading. So that's what it means in a nutshell. Number one, the key to a successful speaking experience is to be talking about the right topic for you, not the right topic for someone else, but for you. Two, the topic must be one about which you have significant knowledge. It really helps because they will find out you don't know too much about it and your speech will not be uh, graded that highly. Three, the topic must be one about which you sincerely care. Again, that really hopes, I mean, helps, sorry. Uh, if you don't really sincerely care about it, people can see it and say, he's just trying to read the words and do the pages and then be done with the speech instead of someone who really cares. I mean, it could be about your pet dog who you really love. And believe me, if you really love your pet dog and you give a speech, people can see it, right? And probably feel it. <laughs> Four, you must have a strong desire to impart or share your knowledge and feelings to the audience. Now that doesn't mean, especially for my strong men in here like Alex and Demogen, uh, you don't have to go up there, give a speech and start crying, right? But to actually show a little emotion, it could be a strong emotion, it could be a little anger. It doesn't have to be crying or sadness. Wow, that's gonna help a lot in your speech. Okay, right, put it be? Five, if you know your material inside out, backwards and forwards, and upside down, all our slang words here, your perform with such confidence that distractions, interruptions, or losing your train of thought will not be a problem. So you know your material like this, you get up to do a speech and your classmates start yelling, hey, that would then, shut up. Or I don't like your hair or your shoes are ugly. That's not gonna make you stop and then say, what, where was I in the speech? Or, I didn't know enough knowledge, so I gotta make it up now because I'm distracted or these guys interrupted me. Instead, you know everything and you're like, ah, oh, do you have any more distractions? I'm getting sleepy now, okay. You guys shut up and I'm gonna continue my speech and you'll be the champ. Okay, six. If you care enough about your topic, you won't fall into the trap of worrying during your delivery and how you look and sound, okay? And you don't wanna worry, at that point, you don't wanna worry about an eyelash that's out of place or your hair is not combed correctly, right? Don't worry and just concentrate on your speech. That's what people have come to hear, not learn about your hair style. Seven, if you really want to impart or share your knowledge and feelings about your topic, you'll have a good time doing so. And the audience will catch your excitement and end up having a good time. Like for example, I've noticed when I've had ladies give a speech about uh, different diets, uh, the woman gets up there and then she says, hey ladies, you ever wanna lose five pounds fast in a day and a half? Boy, ladies get excited and wanna hear and they're like, what is it, you know? What do I got to eat for two days? The watermelon or whatever, right? Peanut butter. So your excitement about it, yeah, 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 this helped me. Um, people will catch your excitement. 
Eight, you can sometimes meet the criterion or rule of caring enough about the topic by acting as if you do. Again, acting. Nine, you can usually find a way to rationalize wanting to give the talk. Now, if you don't know rationalize, it's it kind of means to give yourself the reason why uh, you should give the talk. Again, it was the things I mentioned. Your best friend wants you to give a talk at the wedding. So there's really not a way you can rationalize your, your way out of it, really, if you think about it. It's the opposite. So, you know, you're going to have to do it for certain people, your boss. Uh, 10. If your topic meets all three of the formulas criteria, you couldn't fail even if you wanted to. So basically that is a guarantee. 11, but if you don't meet the significant knowledge criteria, you will lose, you will fail, right? Like Rocky three. Okay. Yeah, remember, I did not do the normal thing like when I teach a literature class or a history class, political science. Um, I stop after each page and then write questions on the right board. Can't do it with this format. So like I said, these questions, repeating again what I said at the beginning of the lesson, you can take a photo, you know, and then write down your answers and then scan it and send it to me in an email, okay? But I do want to go over the questions with you, not just show them. So here, what is the key to success in public speaking? We read that. Again, first questions go to the first part of the reading. Last questions go to the last. So don't say, oh, like Temujin might say, if I pay the teacher, then I will get an A and I don't have to give a speech. That is not the key to success in public speaking. Two, you must have what to speak about your topic. So what must you have to speak about your topic? Again, it's not a funny answer, like put it be a pair of shoes, no. Three, who was the patron saint of public speaking? So basically who was the most famous person identified with public speaking? Was it Michael Jordan, uh, Donald Trump, or Muhammad Ali, who was it? Four, all speakers know their topics. How, what style? I think I mentioned two or three different slang words to use. So that should not be typical. Five, if you know everything about your topic, you can fight what? Don't say, I can fight the heavyweight champion of the UFC. That is not the answer. But if you know everything about your topic, you can fight what? And there might be more than one answer. Hint, hint. Six, how do you gain enough knowledge about a subject to feel confident? Yeah, yeah. Teacher, how do I do that? Yeah, answers in the reading. Seven, what is it okay for some audience members? This should be why, I don't know what happened here with my writer, but why is it okay for some audience members to know more about your topic than you? I don't like that, I won't do it. They know more than me, shut up. No, sometimes it's okay. What's the reason why? Uh, eight. Never in the world has there been what? So don't get philosophical on me. Uh, there's never been an angel that I've seen. You know, No, just stick with the material. Nine. What happens if you have significant knowledge about a topic, but you're no longer excited about it. Please don't say, I will leave the country and never come back. 
that's not the answer. 10, start off your presentation by pretending what? So Alex, don't start off pretending like you're Kim Jong-un. Okay, that's not what I'm looking here. 11, what should you do if you have to give a speech but don't want to? So don't say, I will shoot the teacher and then the class is over. I don't have to give the speech. That's not the answer, even though Inky thinks that Inky and uh, Munkbayar think that's funny. Maybe even uh, Tug Stargov. 12. How do you generate or produce confidence? Right? How do you do that? And it's not by winning. America's Got Talent. It's not how you do it. Okay, so those are uh, the basic ones from your lecture material. Now, just like last week, I wanted you to interview someone, not about yourself. You interview them about them. Because again, in a normal class, I don't start the students trying to present a speech for themselves. It's too nervous, nervous time. It's easier to get information about your classmate and then come up and then say, I want to talk about my classmate. I'm going to introduce my classmate. And then most of the people's eyes go onto your classmate and they don't really look at you as you're speaking, right? So this is a continuation of kind of the assignment in week one. So the purpose here <coughs> to guide you in interviewing a classmate so that you can prepare a brief speech of introduction. This worksheet can also be used to assist you in choosing a topic for your speech. See, you interview about stuff, <coughs> what I'm saying is then from the answers in here, you can pull them out and say, now I have good information for a speech. Wow. Instead of, because it's very hard for people just to sit there with a blank piece of paper and say, Think of a speech and they go, uh, uh, I'm hungry right now. I don't want to do this. I want to play Candy Crush, right? But you do this interview in a classmate and it gives you ideas for your own speech, okay? So here one, you ask the classmate, friend, boyfriend, sister, mom, dad, pet chihuahua, the most interesting stories or facts that I heard or read in the news in the last month were. So you're gonna ask again, your friend, your friend might say, oh, when I found out Donald Trump got uh, COVID, right? Or when I found out the Lakers were going into the championship, you know, or if you're Korean, uh, my most interesting story in the last month is that Kim Jong-un has finally appeared in person. He was missing for the last few months, right? So any of those things you can get from your friend. And two, when I have free time, some of the things I most enjoy are, so again, some of my lady students like Mung Tuya, I think she said she enjoys to rob banks. Uh, Pamela likes to uh, break windows, and then uh, Caroline just loves to speed, go over 100 miles an hour down the streets of downtown. So just say the things that you like to do in your free time. Do I have any more here? Oh, I do. Okay, three. The most interesting thing that I've learned in school over the last year is so doesn't have to be from my class. I'm sure you have interesting things you've learned from the monks here. So you can write what it is. Hopefully you don't write something like, I learned that when I put the switch on the wall up, the light comes on. When I push the switch down, the light goes off. Hopefully there's something deeper than that, okay? For the best movie I've seen in the past year is, so you're gonna have to talk about a movie you saw before COVID. I think they closed the theaters in April. So whatever you saw, 
uh, January, February, or March. That's what you put down, right? Don't tell me. I saw a movie last week. Uh, okay, I will allow you to talk about a movie you've seen on Netflix or something, if you want. Because if you can't remember back to uh, March. Like right now, I'm trying to think, what movie did I see? <laughs> I'm not sure. It's been so long, I haven't gone to the movies, right? So Netflix is okay. Just read about it, talk about it, write it. Five, the most intriguing, the most intriguing is like interesting, exciting entertainer or entertainment in America today is blank. And then you have to write the reason why you enjoy this person so much, okay? Uh, and it doesn't mean that you like them, it's just you seem, you look at them as being the most intriguing. Um, I can tell you years ago for me, like, you know, you're here, so you're gonna have to pick a foreign person. But uh, <clears throat> when I started teaching in K-Town and I started watching uh, Korean television with my students, there was this one famous Korean guy. I think he was a clothes designer. And to me, he was the most intriguing or strange character that I saw on uh, Korean TV. And no, it wasn't Kao Dong. It was Andre Kim. It looked like his hair was spray painted on and he always wore a white jacket and he did some weird kind of signature. So to me, you know, he was the most intriguing entertainer at the time in Korean television for me. Now, since Michael Jackson has passed away for a number of years, um, one of the most intriguing people is probably Lady Gaga. I don't really like everything she does. I like a couple of her songs, but um, you know, she's, I've seen her come to music shows wearing a dress made of meat. I've seen her come to Oscar, uh, parties inside of a giant egg and then came out of it and other intriguing or strange things. So everybody has a different one. Let me know who it is. I'm trying to give you good examples. Okay. And that's it. Okay. All right, so I'm back. Hello. So we've ended the lesson for the second week. Um, I hope it gets, and it will get a little cooler for you. And you enjoy yourself. So uh, it's nice having a class with you today. And take care. Okay. I will talk to you next week. Bye-bye.